Revelation chapter 1 is where we are at tonight and probably will be there next Wednesday night and maybe even the one after that. I apologize for that, sorry. Right now we are looking at verses 1 through 4 uh, as we're looking at the introduction into this book. So what I'm going to focus on tonight is just trying to get us through verse, the first part of verse 4. Uh, last time we were together, we left off in verse 1. And so let's go there, let's read that uh, so we can get the context and we'll move on with this introduction uh, into the book that is right here in the book, verses 1 through 4. John writes and says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now as we go through verse 1, I just want to remind you, number one, the revelation. It's not the revelations, it's a singular revelation, one revelation, and the revelation is of, of course, as we see here, this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation, again, is where we, this, from this Greek word, we get the English word apocalypse, which doesn't refer uh, here at all to cataclysmic events that will happen in the end times, though there, there will be those, and the book of Revelation mentions them. That's not what the word means. The word means an unveiling, an uncovering, a disclosing, a revealing and so it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, notice. So it's the revealing, the unveiling, the disclosing, the uncovering of a person, Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of John. It's not the revelation of St. John the Divine, as some of your Bibles may have that heading for the book of Revelation. Some of your Bible publishers have decided to give the book of Revelation their own, its own name, and they've decided to do that for you. This is not the revelation of John. This is the revelation, notice, of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the central figure, the central person, the central theme to the whole book. This is not a book about end times, though it speaks clearly about the end times. It is a book about Jesus Christ. So if you want to get to know Jesus more, see Him clearly, study this book. Okay? So it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And again, Jesus is revealed to us in this book in five different ways. At least five different ways. And I'll give them to you again in case you missed them last time. In chapters 1 through 3, Jesus is revealed to us as a high priest or the high priest. In chapters 4 and 5... He's revealed as the lion and the lamb. In chapters 6 through 18, he is the judge, Judge Jesus. Just in case you thought it was Judge Judy, you're wrong. It's Judge Jesus. And then in chapters 19 through 20, he is revealed as the king. And then finally, in chapters 21 and 22, he is the bridegroom. Okay? And so, notice, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, that's speaking of God the Father. We'll talk more about that later if we have time. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him. That's Jesus. The Him here is Jesus. Okay? To show His servants. That's the servants of Jesus Christ. In this particular instance, we're going to see... One of his servants is John. And it says here that he gave him this revelation to show his servants things which must shortly take place. The word shortly here does not mean these things will happen soon. The word here speaks of these things will happen suddenly. That whenever they begin to happen... They will happen very quickly in a short period of time. That's very important to remember. Because depending on how your translation or how your Bible translates that verse, it can be very confusing and has confused many people to, to lead them into believing some, some things that are not accurate about the book of Revelation. Uh, it wasn't what the Lord wasn't saying here to John was all these things are going to take place real soon, John. Because we see things in this book that have not happened yet or have taken place since, since the 2,000 years that it's been written. So it's not the word soon here. 
Like these things are going to happen soon, but shortly means that when they begin to happen, they're going to happen quickly or suddenly. Once they begin, it'll be a short period of time before it's all wrapped up. And uh, that period of time, particularly, seven short years. And that's a short period of time compared to human history and compared to eternity. And so notice it says here in verse 1, And he sent, that's Jesus, sent and signified. And signified means that he revealed this to John in signs, in symbols. The book of Revelation is a book of signs and symbols. Okay? And so that's why you have all that symbolic imagery in the book of Revelation that you do. So again, it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing how this book is written. We've covered all the details of this last time we were together. But he sent, and I'm sorry, verse 1, and he sent and signified it, that's the revelation, by his angel to his servant John. So to his angel, or I'm sorry, by his angel to John. So this is very interesting because this is not something that we have... This is not the first time we've seen something like this in the Bible. Not only did Jesus reveal the revelation to John through an angel, but we also see that the Bible tells us that God actually revealed His law that He gave to Israel to Moses to give to Israel, and He revealed it to him through an angel. You realize that? The Scripture tells us that very clear. So God uses angels because they are His messengers. In fact, the Greek word that's used for angels, angelos, here throughout the book of Revelation, literally means a messenger. So God uses angels as His messengers, as He did here. And so it says, He sent and signified it by His angel to His servant, John. Let's talk about John here. Let's get a, a, a context and a, and a perspective on who Jesus entrusted this revelation with in order to get it to the rest of the church. John. Well, we know a lot about John in the Bible, don't we? Yeah, there's a lot we know about John. Let me give you a few things. Well, I'm going to give you several, actually. So number one, John was a fisherman from Galilee. He wasn't a Bible scholar. He knew his Bible. He was Jewish. He'd studied, but he was a fisherman. From Galilee, he was the son of Zebedee and Salome. And he had a brother by the name of James. James actually became at least what we see written in Scripture by name, the second martyr of the church. And we see that in Acts chapter 12, whenever he was put to death by King Herod. And so that's this James that was John's brother. John was a part if you remember, of Jesus' inner circle when it came to the disciples. John was a part of that inner circle along with his brother James and another guy by the name of Peter, right? Peter, James, and John. They are the inner circle uh, that Jesus had chosen. And because they were Jesus' inner circle out of the 12 disciples, it's very interesting because there was things that Jesus allowed them to see and to hear and take part in that the rest of the disciples didn't. So these three disciples got extra insight and extra knowledge and extra experience that the other, you know, what would it be, nine, right, uh, uh, apostles or disciples didn't necessarily get. Let me give you a few. There was the healing of Jairus' daughter. If you remember, Jesus, when he went in to heal her, or wake her up as he put it, as he did, he took with him into the house Peter, James, and John. Not only that, but on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus allowed the disciples to see, get a preview of Jesus in his glory, when he's going to return one day and set up his kingdom, he's going to come in the clouds. Jesus gave his disciples a preview of that in the Gospels. And when he did, he took... Peter, James, and John, these same three up on a high mountain there in Caesarea Philippi to be able to see his glory to come. And so they got to see him before their very eyes be transfigured. 
and to be surrounded in His glory. Not only that, but it was these same men, Peter, James, and John, that Jesus took with Him to pray with Him in the Garden of Gethsemane whenever His hour had come that it was time for Him to be betrayed, it was time for Him to be tried, and time for Him to suffer and die. It was these three men that He invited to the garden to pray with Him for that hour that He was praying while that hour had come. And so, if you remember, obviously, Jesus didn't pick these guys because they were extra special because during that hour of prayer, remember what these guys did? They slept. They slept. They didn't stay up and pray with Him. They fell asleep. So, you know, we know, looking at this, that it wasn't because these guys were super special that Jesus picked them, which I'm glad, because if you have to be super special, I'm out. But they were super special to Jesus for some reason. Also, what's interesting is in his own gospel, John referred to himself, do you remember how? As the disciple whom Jesus loved. There was a relationship that Jesus had with John that was so special that John very humbly makes mention of it. Okay? And it's interesting because we see at the last Passover meal that Jesus spent with his disciples, right before they went out and went to the garden, it was John who was sitting at Jesus' right hand in a place of authority at the table. And John says that that night that he would lean over and put his head on Jesus' chest and was talking with him. So it's as if John got the wonderful experience of hearing Jesus' very heartbeat. It speaks of intimacy. Okay? So that's very important. John had that experience. Out of the twelve and out of the three, it was John whom Jesus allowed to sit in a very special place at that Passover meal. Not only that, but he was the only disciple that was present at the crucifixion. At least as far as the Gospels tell us, John was the only one. Now, the Bible does tell us that they all fled for fear. But John's the only one that's mentioned who was actually at the crucifixion. And if you remember, it was there at the crucifixion as Jesus is dying that he looks down at John and entrusts the care of his mother Mary with John himself. Are you starting to get the idea that John was very close to Jesus. He was very special to Jesus. Yes, he was. He also was the first to the tomb out of all the disciples. Now, him and Peter were running at the same time. Obviously, Peter must have been a little slower because John beat him to the tomb. And he's the first one to see that Christ had risen and had believed that Jesus had risen. John was the first one out of all the disciples to do just that. John also wrote the Gospel of John and the Epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So John wrote four of our New Testament books that we have. John wrote his Gospel. Do you remember why? He tells us at the end of the book why he wrote his Gospel. He wrote his Gospel that we might believe. John's like, listen, all the books in the world couldn't contain everything Jesus said and did. He said, but I've written these things that in reading them you may believe. So he wrote the gospel of John, so that, or his gospel of Jesus, so that we may believe. He wrote his epistles so that we might know how, I'm sorry, that we might know that we have eternal life. John tells us that. These things I write to you that you may know you have eternal life. And then... John pins down the revelation so that we might be ready. So that's interesting, isn't it? You see that? So John wrote the gospel so we may believe. John wrote the epistle so that we may know we have eternal life. And he wrote revelation so that we would be ready. I like that. Jesus 
is seen in John's writings this way. In John's gospel, Jesus is seen as the prophet. And then in John's epistle, he is seen as the priest. And then in the book of Revelation, he is seen as the king. Jesus is the prophet, the priest, and the king that Israel was looking for. And that we should be looking for because he died, resurrected, ascended into heaven, and guess what? He's coming again to rule and reign the earth and to judge. Okay? And we also see God's plan of salvation in John's gospel. We see God's work of sanctification in John's epistle especially 1 John, when I say his epistle, I'm especially mentioning that one. And in Revelation, we see God's sovereignty. Okay? So in the Gospel of John, we see salvation, God's plan of salvation, God's work of sanctification in John's epistle, and God's sovereignty in, here in the book of Revelation. Now look at verse 2, if you would. Well, you know what? Before I go to verse 2, let me mention this. This is in my notes, but I want to mention it because I think it's worthy of mentioning do you remember when Jesus was passing by, Luke chapter 9, if I'm correct, if I remember one of the places, but where Jesus was passing by through the area of Samaria, and the Samaritans rejected him. And James and John, the two brothers of Zebedee, right? Or the, the two sons of Zebedee, those two brothers were there with Jesus. And Je they look at Jesus and they said, hey, Jesus, because they rejected you... Um, do you want us to call down fire from heaven the way Elijah did? You know? And Jesus looks at him and says, listen, fire from heaven, you don't know what spirit you're of. You know, he's like, listen, the Son of Man came to save the lost, not to judge them and condemn them, at least not in his first coming. He didn't do that, right? And he, and he sets them straight. But here's what's amazing. What is amazing is when you look at John's gospel, or John's writings, especially when you look at 1 John, what's one of the reoccurring themes or words you see in 1 John? Love. Love. If the person doesn't love his brother who he can see, how can he say he loves God who he can't, whom he can't see? You see the word love and the theme of love all throughout John's Epistle. In fact, John is referred to by many Bible teachers and scholars as the Apostle of Love. Boy, what a great name. What a great way to, or a great epitaph to have, right? A great nickname. That guy right there is the Apostle of Love, you know? Now, what would have been better if, if he had a Barry White voice to go with it? That would be really, really good, right? I'm the Apostle of Love, you know? No, he didn't. I, I don't know if he did. He might have. I don't know. If we get to heaven and John looks at you and goes, hello. You know, <laughs> Pastor Scott was right. He told us this. But he's the apostle of love. Something happened in John's life. Something happened hanging out with Jesus for three years, three plus years. After he sees Jesus for those three years, love people, heal people meet their needs, preach the truth to them, and serve them. And then, John chapter 13, he served John and the rest of the disciples by washing their feet. In fact, John chapter 13 actually tells us that Jesus loved his own and he loved them to the end. And it tells us about his, him washing their feet. And then, of course, after that, he dies for them. John is there at the cross. He sees it all. Listen, between that and the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming upon him, John changed. He changed from hellfire, brimstone, bring it down on them, Lord, to let's instead, let's love them and love one another. In fact, what's interesting is church tradition tells us that after John was set free from the island of Patmos, where he's writing this book, the book of Revelation, we'll talk more about that later, when 
Church tradition tells us that when he left the island of Patmos, he was in his mid to late 90s, and that he went back to the church of Ephesus. He was one of the pastors of the church of Ephesus, but in his later years, it's interesting because it said that what they used to do with John, he was so old that they would put him in a chair and brothers from the church would carry him in a chair from church to church all over the area of Asia, which is the, you know, Asia is a Roman province of Asia Minor, or today we call it Turkey. It's located there in the southwestern area or southwestern part of Asia Minor or Turkey. And they used to take John, put him in a chair, and carry him around to each one of those churches before he died in his later years so he could speak to the churches as an apostle. It's recorded, one church historian records that when they did that, every church that John went to, and every time he went to those churches, he would sit in his chair, he'd put his hands up, and he'd smile, and he'd look at the believers, and he would say, my little children love one another. That's how he spent his last years. He had one message. He had one string on his banjo. And he played it all the time. So it's amazing when you do a study, a character study of John, you'll see that his life was so impacted by Jesus' love for him that it caused him not only to love Jesus, but to love others. It's powerful. Very powerful. That's why he would say, hey, how can you say you love God who you can't see when you don't even love your brother who you do see? Wow, powerful. And so, that was John. That's who's writing this revelation. So obviously, there was something about John and the closeness and the intimacy that he had with Jesus that Jesus would entrust John with this revelation to write it down accurately and to make sure it got to those seven churches in that area of Asia. Okay? Look at verse 2. Hey, we're done with verse (laughs) 1. Verse 2. And it says, Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all the things that he saw. Now, again, John most likely is the last of the 12 original disciples that's still living. Again, this book was written... Most Bible scholars agree around 95 A.D., at the end of the first century, at the end of John's life. And it's interesting because it tells us that John bore witness to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ and to all the things that he saw. So he's speaking there about the word of the revelation coming to him and everything that he sees. He, he actually was a witness to it. He, he saw these things in a vision, you know. And then he writes them down. But he also gives witness to the testimony of Jesus Christ because, again, because of the time he spent with Jesus. Okay? Now, John wrote most of the Scripture out of the 12 disciples. We already talked about that. He wrote four New Testament books. or I'm sorry, five New Testament books, including Revelation. uh, Four plus this one. And so, John wrote about the pre-existence of Jesus in his gospel, if you remember. Remember how the gospel of John starts? The gospel of John starts with in the beginning, not that it was the heavens and the earth, but in the beginning was the Word. Or not in the beginning, you know, God created heaven. But in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. And then he talks about how the Word then created everything. So... In John's gospel, he tells us about the preexistence of Jesus. John also chronicled the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus in his gospel. John wrote about the Lord's return in his epistle, as well, of course, here in Revelation. And John tells us that he bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ 
In 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, if you would, it's not too far from Revelation. Go back a few books to 1 John, to the first epistle that John wrote. Look what John writes in the first three verses. In verse 1 it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. What's John saying there? John is saying that he bore witness to the word of God and more importantly to the word of God personified in the flesh, Jesus. Okay? And he gives a testimony of it here. He says, verse 2, that life was manifested or made known, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. You see there, John tells us again what we see here in verse 2 that he bore witness to the Word of God and specifically to the living Word of God, Jesus Christ, and gave a testimony of that. Turn back to Revelation chapter 1 now and look at verse 3. My, we are just moving right along, aren't we, until we get here. (laughs) Okay, here we go. Verse 3, Blessed is he who reads, and those who hear the words of this prophecy... And keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now, in verse 3, John tells us that there is a special blessing for those, okay, notice, for those who read this book, those who hear it, and those who keep it. Why in the world pastors don't teach their churches the book of Revelation? Well, I don't know. You know, I've got my reasons, I think, but it doesn't matter. I don't know. But whenever we don't read the book of Revelation as individual Christians, and we don't hear it read at church out loud, and we don't study it, and we don't obey the things that are in it or apply it to our life, we're robbing ourselves of a great blessing from the Lord. And pastors who don't teach this book because of whatever reasons they have, they're robbing the sheep that they oversee and the sheep that they tend to and shepherd of a great blessing. Okay? So this is very important. There's a special blessing for those who read it and those who hear it, and then do those things. So, blessed, he says. Now, of course, we know this word in the Greek is a derivative of the word happy. Okay? Happy is he who reads. Okay? And so, the first, this, this here, this blessed, now, you guys should know this, <laughs> because we just studied uh, for a few weeks Matthew chapter 5, a portion of Matthew chapter 5, which was a portion of the Sermon on the Mount. And that sermon started with what? Hmm? Right, the Beatitudes, the blessings to those who are true believers and real disciples of Jesus. Right? Yeah, that's how it started. Blessed, happy. And this is the way this starts. This section. Now, this is the first of seven Beatitudes in the book of Revelation. Seven times you're going to see that word, blessed is this person, and then there's the qualifier. And so this is the first Beatitude that you see in the book of Revelation. And again, the word blessed simply means happy. Now, there's a special blessing promised to those who hear, I'm sorry, who read, hear, and obey this book. Now, see the word read, where it says those who read, or he who reads? The word reads here, the verb, in the Greek, literally means to read aloud. 
Now, I don't know if you know it or not, but as Westerners, when we read, unless it's publicly, we read silently. That's the way we do. Okay? But in the East, and especially in ancient times, they had the habit of reading out loud. Because not only did they believe that you're gaining something from the text when you see it and you read it, but when you say it out loud, it's coming out and going back through your ears and you're, you're retaining even more of it. And good teachers, you know, those who teach for a living and teach students, you know, if you, if you go to, you know, a school of some sort where, you know, you're, you're getting a degree or you're learning, good teachers will use different methods of teaching They will have you to read something, read the text, read the book that you're studying. They'll have you then take it and write it down, maybe by outlining it or putting your own words. And then they'll lecture you and talk. Okay? They're using all of those facets of your faculties to engage with the text so you learn it. So we learn more. When we see something, hear something, write it down, the more we have that coming, you know, the more we uh, have those different um, elements of learning, the more we learn. And so it's interesting here because the word here reads means to read aloud. And so it's for the sake of learning, but it's not not only for the sake of learning, it's also so that this letter would be passed around to the churches And so that all the churches could hear the revelation of Jesus Christ that was given to John. Okay? So the book of Revelation, as it was written down on a scroll, it was meant to be read aloud in the seven churches that are being spoken of here. And the purpose for reading out loud was to bring those churches both encouragement because the revelation is being sent to these churches that are going through persecution at the time from the Roman Empire, from the, uh, the Roman government, and also to bring them conviction if need be. Okay? So this book was read out loud to them. It wasn't just sent to them. They didn't send them little pocket Bibles of the book of Revelation. Here, everybody gets one, read it, you know. No. This scroll was passed from church to church in that circuit of churches there in Asia. And they were read aloud in the churches. And this shouldn't surprise us because this is exactly what, if you remember, Paul told the young pastor Timothy to do. He said, in your church, at the gathering of the believers, as a pastor is teaching them, he says, to give give heed to the public reading of Scripture. I think it is a shame, again, when pastors don't tell the people who attend their church, bring your Bible because you're going to need it. Because we're going to teach it, not just teach from it, we're going to teach it, and we're going to read it as we teach it. We're not just going to throw the words up on a screen so you can just sit there like you're watching TV or something, you know, and just throw it all up there so you don't have to do nothing but just, you know. No. We should be encouraging, as pastors should be encouraging Christians to bring your Bibles to church. Open them up to hear. Let's read this together. Do you notice when I'm teaching how many times I will tell you if I'm making a point or I'm reading something, I'll say, look at your Bible. Look what that says. You know why I do that? I know what it says. I've already studied it. You know? Trust me, that week I studied it a lot. I know what it says. I want you to know what it says. I'm not, more, I'm not so concerned with you understanding everything I say in the sense of, you know, What I got to say is so important that you miss what the Bible actually says. If you leave here and retain anything, I hope it's Scripture rather than, you know, John may have had the voice of Barry White. You know what I'm saying? Now you'll never forget that, right? It's like, it's like, don't think of a pink elephant. Y'all did it just now. I know you did. So the book was written out loud. And so, notice what he says here in verse 2. He says, And those who hear the words of this prophecy, so they were to read it, read it out loud, the people were to hear it, and then it says, And keep those things which are in it. In other words, 
there is to be, like there is with every other book of the Bible, there is to be application of the truths that are in it in our lives. Okay? Listen, you must both hear and obey the words of the revelation in order to inherit the blessing of the revelation. If you're just coming to these studies and reading this book because you want to hear me speculate on what the mark of the beast might be and is it available today in a vaccine, (laughs) it's like you're wasting your time. You know, we should be here to learn more about Jesus so we can draw closer to him and live our lives in a way that glorifies him even more. Okay, so that means taking his word and reading it together and hearing it with the intention that we will obey it. I really hope that as we study this book that you will obey The commandment of Mary. Did you say Mary? Yeah. Do you remember that first miracle Jesus did at the the wedding at Cana? Mary looked at those servants after she asked Jesus, hey, will you help them out with their lack of wine here at the wedding? And she looked at those servants and said, do whatever he says. Okay, we're not to pray to Mary. (laughs) Mary was a sinner just like you and I who had to be saved and redeemed. Okay, she's blessed among women, yes. Okay, but she's not the Savior. We don't worship her. We respect her, revere for God choosing her, just like he chooses anyone else to use. Okay, but we do want to obey what she tells us in the sense of that, that commandment. Do whatever he says. Not only this Bible study, but every time you come to church and every Bible study you sit in on, you ought to come with that attitude. I remember years ago reading a a small book by Andrew Murray where in one of the chapters in the book, he was talking about our attitude toward Bible study. Whether we're reading the Bible on our own, studying on our own, or coming and hearing it taught, when we study the Bible and approach the Bible, he, he says we always should approach the Bible very humbly with this attitude, Lord, I want to do everything you tell me to do. I want to obey everything you tell me. That should be our attitude, not only in this Bible study, but every Bible study we, we go to and take part in. Okay, Even when we read our own Bible, we should have that attitude. And so, in order to inherit the blessing that John mentions here in verse 3, you have to hear it, and not only hear it, but obey it. Now, I do want to share this. I, I actually shared it on the radio tonight. It was something interesting. Um, but when it comes to the Hebrew mindset, and you got to remember John was a Jew, and so it's interesting here when he says, he talks about hearing and keeping, hearing and obeying, is because in the Old Testament, the word to hear, okay, is the word shema. Okay, that word comes out and is found more, uh, uh, let me say, uh, more recognizable in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, where the Lord spoke through Moses to Israel and said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Remember that? He says, Hear. That's the word Shema. Okay, and then he begins to expound and and tell them what he wants them to do as he gives that. Well, what's interesting is the Hebrew word Shema not only means to hear, but it's also the same word that in your English Bible is also translated obey. It's assumed. God is assuming that if you hear his word, you're going to obey it. Just like you parents assume that when your children... Hear your commands. They're going to obey them. When your children disobey your commands as a parent, what do you say to them? You look at them and go, didn't you hear me? Of course they heard you. They just didn't obey. Okay? were Were you listening to me? 
You know, they, were, they heard it. They weren't listening because they didn't obey. So were they hearing? No. Oh, they might have physically heard it through their ears, but they didn't really hear it because if they really heard it in the sense that God intends for us to hear it, they would have they obeyed it. And so that's something very interesting. So here's what you see. You, you see that in the Old Testament to the Jewish mind, to hear the Word of God, it's assumed that you're going to submit to it and you're going to obey it. You see? And so this is how we're blessed. is not only by hearing the Word of God, but by doing it, by obeying it. It's what Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 7. Do you remember that? I'm going to turn there for time's sake, but Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, Jesus talked about people hearing His Word... He talked about a wise man and a foolish man. The foolish man hears his word but doesn't do it. Does, the foolish man that hears his word and doesn't obey it is like the foolish man who builds his house on sand. And then when the storm comes, what happens to his house? Washed away. That's a foolish man who hears the Scriptures, who reads the Scriptures and doesn't obey them. He's going to get wiped out. <laughs> Especially you read what's going to happen in Revelation you know, what's going to happen in the future. Those who are left here that don't take heed to this book, they're going to get wiped out. But then Jesus talked about the wise man was the one who built his house and put the foundation on a rock. And, of course, when the storms came, it didn't shake the house at all. He said, that's the wise man. The wise man is the one who hears my words and keeps them or does them. Or we would say today in our modern vernacular, those who apply those truths to their lives. Okay? Also, James chapter 1. Turn there if you would. Let's, let's read this one. Uh, again, just go a few books to your left, backwards from Revelation there. Come to the book of James chapter 1. Now this James is not John's brother. This is Jesus' brother. And look at chapter 1 and look at verse 22. Well, hey, go back to verse 19. That's too good to leave out. James says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, or quick to hear, and slow to speak, and slow to wrath, or slow to anger. Now, this is a verse that I taught both of my sons when they were young. And I taught them that the Lord tells us to be swift to hear and slow to speak. That's why he gave us two ears and only one mouth. We should t- listen twice as much as we talk. Now, I know in this setting you're like, yeah, well, obey this, why don't you? you know, no, this is, my, this is what I do. So anyway... So we should listen twice as more than we talk. And so, again, he's talking about hearing, right? And then he talks about the anger of man, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In other words, you you can't, you know, out of your own anger, you know, produce righteousness, no matter how hard you try. You can't force people to do what's right. Look at verse 21. It says, Therefore, uh, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word. He's talking about the Scriptures. Which is able to save your souls. Well, how's it going to save my soul? Well, next verse, verse 22. But be doers of the word. Unless you take the word that you hear and apply it, you're not going to be saved. When you hear the gospel, you must then act upon it with faith, right, in order to be saved. And every other scripture is that same way for us as believers. We have to read it, we have to hear it, and then we have to apply it to our lives to get the blessing from it. But be doers of the word, not hearers only. Because if we only hear the word and don't do it, we deceive ourselves. Well, how do we deceive ourselves? We deceive ourselves in thinking that just knowing what the Bible says is equal to or as beneficial as doing it, and it's not. There are a lot of people who call themselves Christians 
who know the Bible backwards and frontwards can quote it, but don't obey it. And in that case, it's no benefit to them. And they get no benefit from them. Those kind of Christians who think just because I have Bible knowledge makes my heart right with God are wrong with God. They're not right with God. See, you have to hear it and do it. You can deceive yourself in thinking just because I read my Bible or I hear my, you know, I hear Bible studies and I hear it read and taught that that's good. Especially when you come to a Bible teaching church, that's easy to do. Because to come to a Bible teaching church where we open our Bibles, we read it, and then we expound upon it. It's easy to leave here and think, wow, okay, man, I know all this stuff now. Me and God's good. No, you now need to obey it and to put it into practice for it to be a benefit in your life. Okay? So, uh, anyway, I'll leave that where that's at. Look at verse 23. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, but then he goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. You see that? But then he goes on and says, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. This is the same thing Jesus said to his disciples. If you remember, Jesus said, blessed is, is or, or, he says, uh, my disciples are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And he says, those who continue in it are my disciples. Okay? So he says, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This is the, now look at this. This is, I'm sorry, this one will be what? In what he does. So if you want the blessing, you want all the beatitudes, you want to claim them all, then you got to obey what it says. So turn back to Revelation 1. And I want you to notice here in verse 3, I want you to notice that the book of Revelation is a prophecy. Do you see that? Look what he says. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. So John refers to the revelation as a prophecy. Now, between one-fourth and one-third of the entire Bible, which is about 28%, is prophecy, prophetic scriptures, predictions about the future, okay? A large number of those have already been fulfilled, okay? And that gives us confidence that those prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled will be fulfilled because of the track record that we have in Scripture of the Lord keeping His promise and keeping His Word. Okay? So listen, God makes predictions or prophecies in Scripture because, you know why He does it? Two reasons. Number one, because He knows the end from the beginning. Prophecy is history written in advance. That's a simple way to put it. It's history written in advance. God, because of His foreknowledge... And because of his omniscience, he knows everything. God knows what's going to happen in the future. Okay? And he tells us in his word through prophecies that he gives to prophets and to apostles. Okay? And so, the first reason God does this is to show us who he is. He's God. Uh, he, He does this because he can. And he does it to show us and to prove who He is. Okay? Listen, there's no other religious book that makes predictions about the future. None. Only the Bible does. And you know why those other books don't? Because they're written by men. They're made up pagan religions. Man doesn't know the end from the beginning. He doesn't know the future, apart from the knowledge of God. So therefore, those other books are... You know, they don't have this element in them like the Scriptures do, okay? And I don't want to get into the amount of prophecies and all of that, but my goodness, just when it comes to Jesus alone being the Messiah, there are well over 300 and some prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in His life just in, the, in, in, in His ministry and in His death and burial resurrection 
over, way over 300 prophecies that he fulfilled that were written in the Old Testament, okay? And so when you look at the Scripture, what gives us confidence that God is going to do those things he tells us that haven't happened yet is his track record. All of those prophecies that have been fulfilled, okay? So it's very important. But let me give you a couple of Scriptures here. Just, I'm going to give you just two of them. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. Here's what it says. Remember the former things of old. This is God speaking to Israel or to Judah through Isaiah. It says, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Oh, really? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Jews says, he's the only God. There's none beside him. Oh, really? Yahweh, right? Well, how do we know? He goes on to say this declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. In that verse, God says, I know the end from the beginning and to show you and to prove that I am the true God is the reason I do it. Isn't that amazing? Now, did you know this? Now, And there's other scriptures I could give you. Isaiah 42 is another one. Uh, that has that same language in it. But let me give you this one. How about from the New Testament, John? John chapter 13, verse 19. This is Jesus. Now, if Jesus is God in human flesh, truly the Son of God, then He shares the attributes of God, even though He's wrapped in skin, He still shares the attributes of God. So Jesus knows what's going to happen in the future, does He not? Yes, He does. In fact, He said this to His disciples, At that last Passover meal, John 13, verse 19, he says, concerning, listen, concerning Judas being his betrayer, he says, now I tell you before it comes or before it happens that when it does come to pass, you may believe I am he. Jesus actually told his disciples, I want to tell you something that's going to happen in the future. And when it does, you will know that I am who I say I am. Okay? Okay? So this is amazing, an amazing thing that God tells us there. And notice what it says in verse 3, the very last five words. It says, for the time is near. The time is near. Now, let me go ahead and say that the word near here is very similar. It's It's not the same Greek word, different Greek word. But the idea of the word near here is very similar than the word shortly in verse 1. The word shortly in verse 1 doesn't mean this is going to happen soon. But again, it, it, it means it's going to happen suddenly. The word near here is, it is not, the meaning of it is not, John, get ready, these things are near. These things are going to happen again. They're going to happen very soon. That's not the meaning of the word. Literally, the meaning of the word near here is imminent. Imminent. Okay, with an I. Not imminent with an E. The word imminent with an E means if somebody's imminent, that means they're important. Okay? The word imminent with an I means that something is going, that something can happen at any moment. Something that's imminent could happen at any moment. Okay? So that's what we're being told concerning Jesus Christ Himself. And this revelation, listen, it's all going to, as we're going to see in, 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 uh, in chapter 4, it's all going to start happening when the rapture takes place. When Jesus resurrects the dead believers and raptures away the living believers, when that happens, okay, all of this stuff from chapter 4 on through the book of Revelation is going to happen all in a short period of time, okay? But what's amazing is that rapture, Him coming, the beginning of the day of the Lord, the beginning of all this could happen at any moment. Listen, there are so many scriptures in the New Testament that tells us that the coming of the Lord is imminent. In other words, there are no prophecies, there's nothing that has to happen in God's plan for the rapture and the resurrection to take place. Nothing. And it's very clear when you read the New Testament, 
that the apostles felt the same way. I mean, you read the New Testament and you will see that they had a sense that once Jesus ascended to heaven, that he could come back at any time. I mean, this is, why, this is why Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Remember when he writes this? He speaks about the rapture and the resurrection happening as if it's going to happen in his lifetime. And he says, hey, when the Lord comes in the clouds, he says, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we which are alive and remain. I'm convinced Paul thought it was going to happen in his lifetime. But that's not the point. The point isn't when's it going to happen. The point is, it's going to happen, and it could happen at any time, even to the point to where we have so many scriptures written in that context or written with that idea in mind that the Lord could come at any time. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. Now, let me give you just two of them. One of them is James chapter 5, verse 8. Here's what James says. James says, you also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. He wrote this 2,000 years ago. See? He wrote this 2,000 years ago. Coming of the Lord is at hand? What do you mean at hand? What he's saying is it, it's imminent. It could happen at any time. See? And then you also have uh, Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Paul said... And do this, knowing the time. In other words, he says, be very discerning of the times you live in. He says that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. Now listen to what Paul says. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Well, let me ask you a question. If the coming of Jesus, if, if the rapture and our salvation as Christians, which... Boy, we had time to get into this, right? Romans chapter 8 talks about that when Jesus comes, you know, we're going we're gonna to experience the redemption of our bodies, talking about the resurrection and the rapture and, and us being changed into His image, uh, being, being given glorified bodies like His, okay? So many scriptures about that. And so what's interesting is Paul is saying that to the people he's writing to there in Rome, he's saying our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Well, if they had that kind of imminency concerning the coming of Jesus, how much more are we near to our salvation than we first believed? If Paul, 2,000 years ago, thought they were really close, how close are we? You know, and like I said, the last, the last days began... Right? With the death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, and the coming of the Holy Spirit. That's when the last days actually begin. If the last days actually began in the first century, here we are in the 21st century. How much more closer are we to the rapture of the church and the resurrection and the day of the Lord beginning? You see that? We're way closer. Again, I like what John uh, Corson says. Pastor John Corson says, listen, we're not just in the last days. We're not just in the last hours. We're not just in the last minutes. Pastor John says, we're in overtime. <laughs> it's time for him to come, you know. I like that. And finally, oh, you know what? I got to stop. Verse 4. Look at what it says in verse 4. John, we'll, we'll end with this. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Okay? And so, these are the churches that John is going to take this letter, this revelation, he's going to make sure it gets around to all those churches. They're in, again, the southwestern portion, seven of them, in the southwestern portion of modern-day Turkey, uh, what was called the province of Asia at that time in Asia Minor. Now, we know this, right? Seven is the biblical number of completion, okay? And uh, we don't have time to get into all that right now. But the number seven is used no less than 54 times in this book. Seven's a very important number. It's the number of completion. And again, when it comes to these churches, not only were these seven churches that were existing in John's day, but those seven churches also represent seven eras of church history that for John was future, but for us, we're at the end of it. 
And so those seven churches represent the completion of church history. Okay? So, very interesting. So notice that this book is written to who? It's written to believers. It's written to churches. It's written to Christians. This book is for us. <laughs> okay? And uh, it's interesting because there's things that are said in this book that make, make it very clear that ri it's written to Christians, but many times, you know, we think it's written to sinners. Let me give you, for instance, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. You guys have heard this, right? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice, he says, and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. And a lot of times when we give an altar call or we, you know, try to compel non-believers to put faith in Christ, don't you hear him knocking at your, heart's, at your heart's door? If you'll open up, he'll come in. And you know what? That's true. That's true. And I've been guilty of using that verse to, to try to lead sinners to, to Christ. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It just wasn't written to sinners. It was written to the church of Laodicea, to Christians who were lukewarm. You see that? So this book is written to believers. So if it's written to us, how much more should we take it seriously and read it and study it and hear it and obey it? Okay? And it's interesting, too, because not only is Jesus here writing to seven churches, but someone else in the New Testament wrote to seven churches. Do you know who it was? Paul. If you look at the number of churches that he wrote, not the number of epistles, but the number of churches he wrote to, he wrote to seven different churches, which is very interesting. Again, it tells us that we have the completion of what we need in the New Testament as far as instruction to the churches, which I love that, right? Again, Asia, I already shared that with you. It's the Roman province of Asia. And let's end with this. Why these seven churches? Why is Jesus sending this revela his revelation, okay, by an angel, to John, to these particular churches. Number one, I already shared it earlier, because they literally needed the encouragement. They were being uh, persecuted greatly. They needed it. They needed it for encouragement and possibly also conviction. They also, what's interesting is they also, as I've shared this before, they paint a picture typical of all local churches as well as church history. When you look at those seven churches, every local congregation can be described in one of those seven ways. So a lot of times we can be looking at ourselves when we look at those seven churches. But they also are a layout of the seven eras of church history. As I said before, for John was future and for us here we are living it out, probably toward the end of it, most likely, as I believe. And then the, also the geographical location of these churches formed a rough circle. So this was a circuit where this letter could get around to those particular churches. And so with that, we will stop right there.